Hi guys and welcome to Particle Physics Brick by Brick. In this video we are going to be talking about the force of electromagnetism. We're going to start by talking a little bit about history. Since the times of ancient Greece it was known that if amber was rubbed with a bit of fur it possessed the ability to attract light objects towards it but two equally rubbed pieces of amber would repel each other. This is actually where we get the name for electricity because amber in ancient Greek is electron. The same thing happens with pieces of glass. Rub two rods of glass with silk and again they will make light things dance about but the two glass rods will repel one another. So it seems as if the amber and the glass behave in the same way when they are rubbed but quite interestingly when you rub amber with fur and glass with silk and you bring the two together they don't repel one another instead they actually attract one another which is the opposite of the effect that happens when like materials are brought together. Now in 1733, Sistene de Fay in France named these two different types of electricity from the amber electron, resinous and vitreous. Resinous electricity was associated with amber and vitreous with glass and similar materials. But in 1750, the polymath Benjamin Franklin decided to go for a different tack. Instead of calling these things different names, he came up with an analogy of using numbers to actually talk about electricity. His idea was that there was some underlying electrical fluid which was responsible for these two different types of electricity. One object, the glass, had an excess or a positive amount of this fluid, whereas the amber or the resinous type of electricity had a deficit or negative amount of this electrical fluid. While he was incorrect about the fluid, we know today that it is to do with charged particles in the material itself. So in Benjamin Franklin's model, we're not talking about two different types of electricity from two different materials. We are talking about either negative charges or positive charges. So in his model, two negative charges are alike and so they would repel one another. Two positive charges are alike and so they too would repel one another. But if we brought together a positive charge and a negative charge, i.e. two different charges, then they would attract one another. And in 1785, Frenchman Coulomb put all of this together in his famous equation. Coulomb's equation told us that the force of attraction or repulsion is equal to some constant value, which determines the strength of the electromagnetic force, multiplied by the two charges of the particles multiplied together. This is then divided through by the separation of the objects squared. And so Coulomb's equation told us the force and its direct relationship with the electric charge of the objects. Now I know I said we were going to ignore gravity when it comes to particle physics, but it's worth talking about it here just to give you an idea of electromagnetism, because both being infinite forces, they were modeled in both the same way originally. And we're more familiar with the way in which gravity works. For instance, we know that if a ball is on the edge of a hill, quite naturally, it will roll down it until it reaches the bottom. Now, this is because it is seeking a lower gravitational potential energy. As the ball gets closer towards the centre of the Earth, it lowers in potential energy. Now, what we forget sometimes is the fact that this ball is not only falling towards the Earth, but the Earth is also falling towards the ball. That is because they are both experiencing the same magnitude of force. That's Newton's third law, equal and opposite reaction forces. And so what happens is there is a dip in potential energy between the ball and the Earth. And when the two fall down towards each other, they lower in gravitational potential energy. And the force of attraction arises because both objects, as with everything in the universe, is trying to seek a lower energy state. If there is a lower energy state possible, then a force will exist to move that object towards it. Now let's get back to electromagnetism. Now two electric charges, as we said, if they're opposite in charge, will attract one another. And now we know the reason behind this is actually because if we plotted out the electric potential between the two, it would be much lower between the two charges. And this is the reason that they attract one another. They experience a force of attraction because they are being led towards a lower potential energy. Notice when they come together and they form something which is electrically neutral, they are at the lowest potential energy they can be at. This suggests that something with zero electric charge or electrically neutral is lower in energy than something that has an electric charge. 
and this is indeed true. Objects which are openly electrically charged are higher in potential energy than objects that have no charge at all. This means that the entire universe is not only seeking towards a lower potential energy, but also, through the force of electromagnetism, seeking electric neutrality. The universe doesn't want to be electrically charged, it wants to be electrically neutral, and the force of electromagnetism makes sure that this is achieved. Now the reason that two like charges repel one another is exactly the same reason that two opposite charges attract one another. And that is because when they repel, they are actually going to a lower electric potential. Because the electric potential between two like charges actually rises, which means that the lower energy is actually away from the other charge. And that is why they experience a force of repulsion. The magnitude of the force, as shown by Coulomb's equation, is related to this electric potential. In fact, it's to do with the slope of the potential. The steeper the slope, the greater the force. And as the slope levels out, the force decreases. This is exactly what we see from Coulomb's law. The greater the separation of the charges, the smaller the force. The smallest magnitude of charge that we can have is known as the electronic charge. It is the charge on the electron itself. And that's because the electron is a fundamental particle. We can't divide it up anymore. And therefore, the smallest unit of charge is associated with the smallest particle possible. Now, the electron and its heavier versions all have what we say is negative one of this electronic charge, which is a rather small number of coulombs, which is the standard unit of electric charge. Because the quarks combine together in groups of three to make particles, they have slightly different fractional amounts of this electronic charge. The up-like quarks, the up and the charm and the top, all have positive two-thirds of the electronic charge, while the down and its heavier versions, the strange and the bottom, have a minus one third of that electronic charge. The neutrinos have zero electric charge. They don't interact at all with the electromagnetic force. It can be seen that the quarks must have this electric charge if we take the convention that a proton is made from two up-type quarks and one down-type quark. This can only work if the up-type quarks have a charge of plus two thirds and the down-type quark a charge of minus one-third. Summing together the charges on the individual quarks then leaves us with plus one, which is the electric charge on the proton. And for the neutron, we say that conventionally it's made up from one up quark and two down quarks. And again, if they have those charges, of plus two-thirds for the up, minus one-third for each of the downs, then we get a charge of zero for the neutron. Now, I know I mentioned that these were the 12 building blocks of nature. But in fact, we know that there exist more building blocks than just these 12. In fact, there exists a mirror version of all of these particles. Every single particle has an antiparticle version of itself. Each one of these antiparticles has the same mass as the original particle, but the way in which it interacts with all the forces is opposite. This can clearly be seen with the electron having a negative electric charge on the far left, and its antimatter version, the positron on the far right, having a positive electric charge. With opposite electric charges, they obviously interact via the electromagnetic force in totally opposite ways. That means that the charge on all of the up quarks, being plus two thirds, is opposite to the minus two thirds that all of the anti up quarks have. And the down quark has negative one third, while the anti down quark has positive one third the electron minus one, and the anti-electron, which also has a unique name, the positron, has a charge of plus one. The neutrinos, obviously, the charges don't change because they were zero to begin with and they will be zero afterwards when we look at the antimatter version. So I hope you understand that it is a particular property which we call charge that defines how things interact via the electromagnetic force. In fact, we'll find that it is charge of different types that dictate how these particles interact with all of the other types of forces. So now, all we have to do is think about what we mean by a strong force charge and a weak force charge, if we are to truly understand the forces of nature. Thanks for listening. If you would like to know more, subscribe to my YouTube channel or follow me on social media for more information. You could also buy the book. Particle Physics Brick by Brick is available through online retailers and many local bookstores. Other languages are also available.
If you follow this bit.ly link, you can also get access to lots of educational resources and information on where you can get your hands on LEGO to play along. LEGO is a registered trademark of the LEGO Group, which does not sponsor, authorise or endorse these videos in any way.